Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, what a fantastic turnout. I wasn't really expecting this, but maybe there's something in the scale of this turnout which is interesting about the topic and relevant for this topic. Um, I'll have to um, start with my great colleague here, Mike Trousdall, said, Adrian, I know you're interested in sustainability and you're interested in materials. You have to read this book, which is by Jared Diamond, which is about collapse. It's about the decisions that we make, you know, as a society to either succeed or to fail. You know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're on the bone point of a collapse, but he recounts in the book a, a really interesting uh, story about Easter Island, and as they were cutting down that last tree on Easter Island, what was going on in the mind of the person who was cutting it down? You know, here it goes, last one. I hope they got their stats right about the, the amount of timber we've got on this island. So what are we thinking? It's given me time to pause and reflect. But what are we thinking about when we're making decisions about the use of materials on projects? And how does that actually relate to our overall system pressures that we have as well about resource use and climate change and other things. So this is a reflection really on this, where I think we are in terms of the use of timber in the industry overall. I've had the opportunity of working with a number of people in this room on a number of really uh, fantastic projects uh, which have built up in me my understanding what I think the material qualities are about. And to be honest, that to me seems to be reasonably self-evident that it's a, a natural material. It has an aesthetic and tactile property, which is unlike uh, some other materials. It seems to connect well with ideas of resource use and lower carbon uh, impacts, especially with the body carbon. But selfishly as well, it's, uh, it's a fantastic material as an engineer to work to. And so selfishly, I quite like designing with uh, a material which has slightly diverse properties compared to traditional materials. And it also has, because of the impetus in the marketplace, enormous potential, which is again interesting for engineers in terms of research and development and application. So all of those things to me seem to suggest that self-evidently timber was, was good. And interestingly, it also seemed to connect to our industry ideal for off-site prefabrication and efficiency and application of efficient modes of delivery of our buildings as well. And we've been looking at this for many, many years, and there's enough people here with a, there's about as lack of amount of hair of eyes got or grey hairs to remember that Banwell and Lathan and Egan in the, 90, in the 80s, we were all fascinated about this idea of system change in the construction industry and how to deliver things more effectively. In timber, even back in Gropius's time, was seen as a potential material as part of that delivery of efficient construction. And just to give some structure to the rest of the talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to use a model. And don't worry, this is about the only slide that you're going to actually have to think about for today. Um, this is borrowed from Kevin Kelly, who, is the, who was the first editor of Wired magazine. And in his uh, fantastic book, which is essential reading, if you actually want to be a science fiction film director called uh, What Technology Wants. It's about the impetus and the changes of how technology affects society and how it's subsumed into our thinking. And he puts this model for technological design in this triad of three elements, which are structural, which is, I think, one of the topics of a previous speaker about the natural evolution of system change in terms of technologies, that those are contingent and connected to our history, but also importantly, and this is one thing for us to investigate here later today, about the intent that we have on projects to deliver them in a particular way. So unlike natural systems, he was suggesting that we have to have an intent to deliver things in a particular way when it comes to technology rather than in nature. So I'm going to use this just as a, a frame for um, some of the discussions <coughs> later on. Just to give you an example of that, he quotes... Uh, the connection between chariots and the space shuttle. 
So here we have you know, chariots, and the sizes of chariots are actually pretty much based on the, the width of two horses. And those chariots formed the roads in Roman times, and those roads actually formed the basis for carriageways and coaches. And coaches became uh, the, the formation for our railway systems. We've transferred those railway systems all around the world and to the States. And funnily enough, when they were making the space shuttle, they're taking the solid rocket fuel engines from Utah to Florida, and the size of those engines is based on the sizing of the railway tunnels, which is all connected back 2,000 years ago, basically, to the chariots. And as some wag put it, and I probably won't really leave this out, that uh, we have one of the most technological transportation systems in the world, <laughs> which seems to be connected historically back to the anatomy of two, two horses. So we have this contingent historical connection in all our designs to something that's gone before. So I've talked a bit about what I found was self-evident, but it's very interesting when you talk about projects to, you know, with your colleagues, but also with clients. And speaking to many clients about timber, there seems to be a little bit more scepticism. And it's timber is good, and there's a comma, there's a small pause, and they go, right, there's a little bit of a question mark about, about it. Not necessarily that timber is somehow bad, it's not absolute, but there's just how, how good is this, this product, and how do we fit that into the practical applications of technology and the building designs that we want to do. And let's go back and use that, um, that triad a little to try and investigate some of those issues. That historically, we've had uh, amazingly beautiful timber buildings built up, though, from craft that we've used chisels and manpower to make timber in beautiful and sophisticated ways. And the Japanese have been expert at this. But today, our, our industry is actually... It's more factory-based, and it, it go around a timber expo, and you'll see some amazing kind of routing machines and CNC cutting machines, which is transforming us from this craft-based industry to this factory-based industry. And in many designs, we would design out the need for craft, and we'll try and make that into the most efficient and applicable system to suit those factory methods. And we also have an industry which is enormously complex. Over years and years and years, we've developed a methodology of delivery of buildings in a variety of places, in unknown conditions, with different people on projects, all of these things based around delivery of buildings in an unexpected way. And I'm quite a fan of that, actually. I think the industry does exceedingly well, given the circumstances in most cases, to deliver under these conditions. But what it does do is it develops some inertia in the system. So because of that scale of the industry, because of the connections in the supply chain, it means that changing from one mode of application to another is exceedingly difficult. You know, if we were going to use the Kuhn classic paradigm uh, ideal, getting people to work in a completely different mode as in an off-site system is just really hard to do. And designers themselves, and as designers, engineers, and architects, have become quite familiar with working with particular materials over time. So we're used to working in steel, we're used to working in concrete and understanding the layering of those systems, but we're just not as familiar yet with working in timber and all of the componentry and all of the styling that goes with that. So I'm going to give you an example from a previous project about how it's actually worked on a project for in timber design. This is um, the Low to No project in Helsinki, uh, sometimes called Eret as well. 65% of the land area in Finland is covered with softwood forestry. So it's a, it's a very big industry, paper, pulp, timber product, all really big elements in terms of design. Most of that product, though, gets taken, exported to places like Germany. They also have their own developed you know, forestry and timber <laughs> systems. And Germany and Austria are actually adding all the value to that product to make things and actually then ship them back to us. So despite 
all of this available resource, Finland was not particularly developed in its own application and use of timber as a product in building design, as then we thought. And part of that goes back to their own history about their legacy and understanding of the application of timber. So this is the Great Fire of Ulu of 1822. You know it well. Um, and there's been a number of these. I think they're quite... Um, I think they must have been quite uh, slapdash in Ulu. It seemed to have about four or five fires, actually, or great fires. But this affected the, the design and planning controls and people's appreciation of timber. And it's quite remarkable when talking about timber applications in Finland, people did actually mention big fires of Ulu. It's quite amazing, even though it was 200 years previously. And all of that has led to an enormous amount of use of concrete as the main system building in Finland. And I mean, practically every building we saw is made of precast, prefabricated concrete. And that goes down to the ductwork and all of the services in, in the building as well. They're cemented in and put in, in massive precast elements into these buildings. It's quite phenomenal. So on this competition, this is working with Sauerbrook Hutton, we suggested that it might be a good idea to understand how we might use uh, larger multi-storey timber systems in the residential. So this is about six or seven storeys with a plinth of concrete to allow for some retail. We suggested that as an appropriate methodology to overcome some of the system resistance and see what we could do in terms of the delivery of, of timber in that country. So we set off, we were doing a scoping and concept study, and we thought we had done, well, we thought it was a good job, that we had demonstrated that building multi-storey timber out of cross-laminated timber was about 20% lighter in terms of the frame weight, which amounts to about 10% lighter over in, in terms of the loads going to the foundations. We thought we had demonstrated that it was a use of a natural resource, locally produced, that it was uh, significantly lower in terms of its embodied carbon. Uh, we'd also thought we had demonstrated that the market actually wanted it through a small market survey and looking at people's appetite for timber frame construction. We thought we'd actually demonstrated that as well. We demonstrated, despite the industry being totally predicated on precast off-site concrete, that it was about as fast, if not a little faster, when you take fit on the fit-out trades as well. And using these new technologies, we'd shown that we thought it was efficient and therefore affordable. We did all of this, and we thought this was great. We presented this. Client says no. So what is it that was going on in the mind of this client which led him to say no? This is really important to me. And this is about commerciality and risk. You just didn't want to take that move for being the very first person to put a timber frame system into a market which is dominated by concrete. It was just commercially too risky for them. So what were the risks? And where do we have to put our efforts in terms of taking those risks away. And this was significantly about fire, and they had a new draft fire code, which although allowing timber frame construction was very restrictive in a, in a way that wouldn't be in the UK. So they were looking for building safety, not life safety, which pretty much negates the ability to use fire engineering approaches to the use of timber. They were worried about uh, the perceptions of acoustics in residential projects despite that we could actually demonstrate, you know, um, meeting noise reduction criteria through careful detailing. And we could actually look at ways of finding approvals through the process, despite them being unfamiliar. So in all of these practical measures, these are the things that we found which were much more significant to clients rather than just the use of timber as a structural material. It's all of the componentry. It's all of the layered decision making, which is important actually in making this a commercial and affordable system. Uh, every time I look at this slide, it looks a bit like the start of Frasier, you know. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, we seem fascinated, and I, know, and I know Andrew's looking straight at me as I say this, we seem fascinated and almost a little bit fixated by tall timber at the moment. You know, we've had 30, 42 stories around the world looking at tall timber. And um, 
I must admit, I'm a little bit fascinated by that, selfishly back to the beginning where it's quite interesting about development and how do we push technology on. But I don't necessarily see that is where our effort should go as an industry at the moment. We have much more significant barriers to do with this integration of all of these system pressures at a much more modest scale, actually, somewhere between two and maybe 15 storeys. That's where the bulk of our buildings are. That's where our effort should be if we're, you know, intent and in trying to move this thing forward. So although it's really fascinating about the tall timber, and yes, it might lead to these eyeful moments that uh, Green is talking about, about the impetus and breaking the ceilings of the use of technology in timber, but actually maybe our efforts should be slightly at a little bit more mundane level of something at a smaller scale at the moment. And that's the thing that's actually going to build the uh, momentum in the industry and the confidence in the industry to move this further forward. So tools, fascinating, but I think at the moment, not one that we're, we should really be spending our time and our major efforts. So where are we as an industry now? And I think I will suggest here that our history is actually a little bit wrong. We need to think about a new history. In prefabrication, at least, a lot of our off-site systems were kind of generated a bit from the Victorian era, where we would use our industrial revolution to make systems, put them on a boat, and you can see the legacy of that in, in architecture in places like Australia and South Africa. We exported our Victoriana on boats and built it elsewhere in the colonies. So we had this colonisation of prefabrication as part of our history and legacy. And in architecture as well, we have a familiarity with building in concrete and steel and glass, which has pretty much predicated our style of building and the scale and ways of building for the 20th century. And um, I know others are suggesting that we might move on from that to a 21st century with a materiality in, in timber instead. So design is pretty much geared up around this large industrial supply chain that we have already. But what's really fascinating to me is the scale of innovation in terms of product and product availability which is going on. And let's make this analogy back to Kevin Kelly and the, just the scale of impetus in the change in ICT and te telecommunications that we've had over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. It's enormous. And the scale of innovation and development in, in engineered timbers, in those ones which are like blue lamb and laminated veneer lumbers and cross-laminated timbers, which are systems made up from elements of smaller or even sometimes less quality materials, efficient ways of using materials and generating reliability and predictability for, for design is, is enormous. And we can see this scale, I think, coming through some of the early projects now to a much more you know, there's a lot of momentum in terms of with the architects that we're speaking about, about the possibilities of using wood and using engineered timbers. And I think that will move on as we also bring in hardwood systems into that process from managed temperate hardwood um, sources as well. So maybe we'll start to see increased performance, not just in sort of softwood performance, but in hardwoods as well in the near future. But... As I said, that's history, but we need some intent. And um, it's really interesting, and thanks to uh, Wolf Thistleson for this, that number of people making strives to kind of go out there and agree with their clients uh, a rational intent to actually deliver this stuff. So we're actually delivering our, this new history of different buildings designed in different ways with different materials. And I think that actually should be recognised very differently to our previous history and understanding of timber from smaller scale, let's say platform scale, timber systems. And maybe, and as a couple of gentlemen here come from lend -Lease, and they've been looking quite closely at timber in Australia as well. So the 40 building, now the tallest, I think, um, timber building um, in, the, in the world, they're investigating that. And maybe, maybe we'll have a reverse colonisation from Australia up to the UK by this transfer of global knowledge from people making buildings in different ways and learning from that in different markets. So they may not take the product, but we might take the knowledge. 
So what do we do to actually make this an effective way of building? Well, here's a reworking of the old joke. And this is about the endless stair project. Well, if you want to get to the endless stair, don't start from here. And we didn't start from here. We started from a hardwood cross-laminated timber panel, which is this thing, which is made out of tulip wood, which is a lower grade uh, hardwood from uh, the States, glued together into panels, of which are 60 mil thick. We started with the idea of using material in a different way and working with DRMM and uh, the rest of the, the, um, the, the fabricators and the installers. We came up with a design which you've got about three days to go and see if you haven't seen it uh, before it's taken back down, put it in, repackaged and taken off to, to Venice, we hope. You've got three days to, to look at it. And the design using timber or hardwood timbers in a really effective way to show how, what its properties are. So all of the inherent detailing, all of the layering, all of the directions of the laminates is all suited around the efficient use, designing to timber not designing to any old material and then substitute in timber at the end, but designing inherently with the properties of timber embodied in that from the very, very beginning. And hopefully it's, it's been an amazing project. You know, it had everything from, uh, it's had a flash mob dancing on it to um, Cybermen actually was one of the, um, the people on it we've got photographs of. So we can design in new ways, and we can um, use new materials in new ways and use those effectively. But to do it successfully, we have to start from the beginnings of projects, not take standard buildings and think that somehow we could shoehorn timber in to, to be just a substitute for, tip, for, for steelwork or concrete. It, did, it doesn't work effectively that way. So what would we do to maybe reimagine the building that we're in this morning? So we would probably make the basement out of concrete as, as ever. But the superstructure to this could be quite readily reimagined in, in timber. We could make the cores out of cross-laminated timber panels. It's five or six stories high. We could do that in two or perhaps three lifts. The facade could be similarly made out of large panelized systems, effectively spanning up in a couple of lifts. And the floors themselves, we've done some new calculations on this. We could imagine also meeting the grid requirements of this, which is about seven by nine meters, quite readily in a timber system, either all timber or actually hybrids of timber if we wanted to expose concrete for, let's say, energy purposes of thermal mass. And we could do that, we've done the calculations, roughly at the same thicknesses of floor spans as we have in this building, which is all concrete. So we can do that. We can think about office systems, not just residential um, systems in in timber as well. So we've got an opportunity to do that. So why not, really? Why not? Why don't we do this? So if we've got an industry where we can actually think about it reducing this, you know, the scale of, of loads onto foundations, if we can think of systems where we can actually use it effectively and economically in buildings, if we can think of it as a low carbon and renewable resource, if we can find an appropriate layering of all of the technologies together in terms of acoustics and fire and performance, it seems to me that now we have a real opportunity in the industry to actually make timber an effective and affordable solution for, for building design as well. And all that needs, and I hope this is my rallying call, is just a little bit of intent from everybody on projects to actually push that forward into the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I think your point about the last man standing, cutting down that last tree in Easter Island, was quite a nice base to start on. There was a lot of discussion about the use of timber, and there's a lot of it going on. Personally, I don't find a problem with clients accepting timber. That's not a problem. What is a difficult argument is where is the supply going to come from? Is there anybody who's actually doing a study to find out if the construction industry does a wholesale shift toward timber? What's going to happen to Finland's woodlands and Britain's woodlands? 
it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And I don't know if there's any representatives from the Timber Trade Federation here this morning, because I did actually ask them exactly that question. So what's the base from where we are now in terms of the use of timber as, an, as a material in terms of design? And where do we take it? And what scale could we take it without limiting you know, sustainability and managed forestry capacity overall? Unfortunately, they haven't given me an answer. But what we have seen as an answer is that the scale of forestry is increasing overall. So um, the projections for capacity in softwoods we've seen up to about a million cubic metres in terms of panel. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else in the room who actually knows where we are on that, that project trajectory. But there is capacity now. And I think as it gets used, they might, they might develop more capacity. The forestry in... Us, in um, cover in Europe, we believe, is increasing for sustainably managed forestry and also for temperate hardwood forestry in the States and also in Germany, we believe that is increasing as well. So there is capacity, so let's use the capacity that we have whilst maintaining kind of long-term sustainability of the forestry cover as well. That power climb is a huge hurdle to get over in terms of trying to explain a project that is based mainly on timber is that that question always, always comes up. People have a great image in their mind of slash and burn in South America and the Pacific Southeast. And that's what, they, that's what <coughs> resonates in their mind, and they look at that as being a global, universal problem. We were going to have a slide on this presentation of somehow timber as having a bit of an asbo. <coughs> you know, it's got this um, it's been a bit of a character problem in certain cases about its image in the marketplace. So I, I do fully agree with you that it needs to be clearer. We're fairly clear that it's, it's acceptable and easy to use it now. We don't have to think about totally making everything out of timber. I think what we need to do is have an impetus to actually finding appropriate applications of timber where we can. Let's have an opportunity to allow it to be measured and offered up and compared in all its qualities compared to conventional materials. So it's not it's got to be. Let's say let's have a let's have a level playing field of using it for all of its qualities, comparing it to to other materials. It's fantastic talk, but then I'm really really biased. I work with timber all the time, so it's it's something that was wonderful to hear because coming from an engineer's standpoint, hearing these big ideas is very welcome. But my big concern was this point that comes up quite often as an architect or designer that. You get clients who say, yes, we love it, we've seen grand designs, we know Kevin MacLeod, it's all great and glorious, we love carpenters, but where is this wood going to come from? And hand on heart, it's a very difficult thing to say. Well, I, we're in complete control, we know exactly where it's going to come from, and time and again you find out we're not, and it's trying to work out how can we actually argue this in this one material, that it's something that we can justifiably use considering that Britain, the UK, is a country that it doesn't use a lot of timber. It's not, doesn't come, of course. So it's trying to work out if the UK shifts in this direction, a lot of other people are going to follow suit. So it's, I think it's just fascinating to see a talk like this, to hear a talk and, and hear, hear um, what engineers have got to say. Um, I thought it was really uh, insightful, actually, really fascinating, because I think it's... Um the, the talk that he gave was uh, from a very different perspective to lots of other timber talks and discussions that I've been in. Um, it raised a few eyebrows for me because, um, you know, um, for Len Lease and uh, Elephant and Cast, which is the project that I work on, um, we very much have kind of been trying to push CLT um, and we're very driven and focused behind that. But um, because from the risk perspective and everything else that was talked about, um, you know, we have designed twin tractor design in concrete and CLT, um, which I think, you know, there is a lot of truth in what Adrian was saying about designing for timber from the start, um, which I think that we've, we've probably learned that lesson now, um, and we've built the tallest timber building in the world in Australia, um, which, you know, kind of, that was literally timber designed from the start. And I think now the, um, the other element that raised an eyebrow for me was the, um, you know, the kind of issue about marketing and sales and the market perception. Um, and I think the challenge for the industry is about um, the relationship with banks, mortgage providers. Um, you know, it's fine the industry and the design industry getting behind timber is the right way to move forward. But I think that you know we all need to work together with the banks and the mortgage providers to make sure that they're able to provide mortgages for purchases. And I think that's kind of 
the key risk really um, that we need to manage. And then the last thing was, you know, I really would like to build a tall building in Timber. <laughs> we do a lot of mid-rise, but, um, you know, I would like to do something a bit more ambitious, 30 plus stories. So, um, you know, I think we'll rise to Adrian's challenge on that one. Well, it was absolutely fascinating and it rang so many bells with what we're doing at the wharf. We, we're, as, you, as you know, we're building the Canary Wharf Crossrail Station and we're wrapping it in, in, a, la in a lattice tim timber, timber structure that's designed in concept terms for, uh, for us by, by Foster and Partners. And so we're, we're, we're into lam laminated timber, but we're also into the steel, steel nodes and how it interacts with concrete structures. And as you know, you're the engineers for, for us on it, so you've, you've done a lot, a lot of work in validating what the trades are going to do. But it was rung so many bills, so thank you very much. I thought it was fantastic. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I was just talking to some colleagues over there and thinking about how I kept on thinking of the Katsura Imperial palace in Kyoto which is what 13th 14th century and it's timber and looking at that sort of supply chain and how that's evolved and then yeah it gets you thinking it makes you wonder how that can be applied the endless stair project looks really great um, yeah so it's really good woke me up woke me up to timber and woke me up with coffee so yeah thank you